Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Potts. I'm the executive director of the Eisenhower Institute at Gettysburg College, and I'm excited to welcome you to EI Live to lunch and learn with me today about national security. So I'm actually very excited, not only about this topic, but about my lunch and learn partner, my guest today, Annie Morgan, who is a 2006 Gettysburg graduate. She's also a defense attorney, and she's going to tell us about her, her work with the military there. And she's working on this new program with us that's going to roll out this spring, Emerging Threats in National Security. And it's probably not anything that you're thinking when it comes to uh, national security. So Annie, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to talk to you about this. So, so can we talk first of all about um, your work? You have a very interesting role um, as a defense attorney. You're working for uh, the military, but you have a pretty pretty high level uh, position defending um, detainees. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Sure. Right now, I am uh, I'm employed by the Department of Defense. I am assigned as a defense attorney to the Military Commission's Defense Organization. And in that capacity, I represent one of the high value detainees who is being detained at Guantanamo Bay um, and has been since 2002, Mr. Abdul Rahim Al Nashiri. Um, and I represent him against capital charges. Wow. People have probably wouldn't, you know, when they hear that name, people probably very quickly. Um, uh, remember this case and 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 recognize the name. Um, this is challenging work. Talk to me about. We often hear and, and I'm I'm approaching this really from uh, the position of a former journalist, but also I think just the average person out there, right? Who's who's uh, uh, watching. Um, we often don't think about and realize that we have defense attorneys who work for the Pentagon who are defending um, people who are accused of uh, crimes against America. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting position. Um, you know, I think a lot of people forget that Guantanamo Bay is even open, um, you know, so there's that part of it. And then it, it is an interesting um, sort of position to be both a government employee and sort of an adversary um, in that same capacity. And, you know, that's sort of a testament to our judicial system, right? It's a testament to the fact that we believe in our judicial process enough to ensure that detainees are entitled to counsel. Um, and these cases are just so complex. Um, so my client is accused of committing the USS Cole, being the, the uh, mastermind behind the USS Cole bombing, which was in October of 2000, um, which I'm sure as everybody recognizes was about a year before September 11th. Yeah. But at the military commissions, you also have the five men who are charged with the attacks against America on September 11th. Um, and so these are in very real terms, the biggest criminal cases that our country has ever handled. Um, and they are a case of first impression. Uh, and so it is, it is challenging on a lot of levels. Um, there are a lot of legal and procedural hurdles. Um, it's been a 20 year fight to even, you know, get to the question of what, what if any portions of the constitution apply to our clients, you know, and then beyond that, there's just the logistical challenges, there's language challenges, um, as well as sort of the, the stakes that there's victims out there waiting for justice and that there's, you know, men who have been detained for the greater part of their adult life, maybe wrongfully so. How does a case drag on for 20 years, 20 years, well, 20, what, going on 21 years now, right? Um, like, what's the, like, walk me through what is happening. Um, we've heard, you know, in domestic cases, we often hear um, how, how victims in particular are just frustrated by the, the justice system taking so long. Military tribunals are different, um, obviously. Maybe you can walk us through some of those differences, but what, what causes a case to last so long? Honestly, a persistent attempt by the by prosecutors in the case to restrict the substantive and procedural rights that are granted to the detainees. Um, and so those things that would very um, be very plain and easily settled in federal courts, which is why federal courts are well suited to try terrorism cases, mm -hmm. are not well settled because military commissions operates under statute rather than um, jurisprudence, really. I mean, there, there is no, even, even in the history of military commissions, when you look at how they've happened in our country's history or even internationally, they haven't taken this length of time. Um, and so really, 
you have the legacy that the Bush administration left us with, which was a decision to engage in interrogation attack te techniques that amounted to torture, information that was derived from torture um, that is still now, you know, hotly disputed to what extent, if any, it can be used. And then sort of the other issue of just investigating a case that literally spans continents and, you know, cultures and multiple languages and countries, we're, you know, dealing with treaties between different countries as to what they can and can't permit us to do. Mm. You know, it, it, it makes one seriously question whether there will ever be a satisfactory resolution to these cases. Well, I was just going to ask you, is there any end in sight? I mean, can, can, you know, do you look and say, well, it's taken 20 years, but I think over the next two or three years, we can, we can wrap this up or. I mean, certain, certainly the Biden administration has expressed a commitment to moving these cases along um, and to closing Guantanamo Bay to what extent, you know, that is possible or will happen. You know, I can't, I can't speculate as a, from my perspective, I don't see an end in sight. Um, we are still fighting over classification levels. We are still, we're still fighting over the nuts and bolts that it would take no. to gather a criminal trial. We're nowhere near the meat of what actually needs to be litigated. My goodness. So, so um, your work is just so fascinating. I think we have to lay that foundation so that people know why um, you are an ideal person to, to really work with this national security program. But one more question, and we talked about this at one point, um, aside from the, the nuts and bolts, um, aside from your, your work, um, I was going to say in the courtroom, but not necessarily in the courtroom yet, right? Um, talk about the cultural education um, that you've had working on a case like this? Yeah, it's really, it's interesting from a lot of respects. Um, so my background before joining the military commissions was I was an active duty Air Force judge advocate. But the military commissions organization is both a military organization and a civilian organization. And so what you have is employees who come from, you know, both the private sector, but also then all four branches of the military and the subcultures within each of those. And so it's a really interesting environment to work in because you do have this sort of just education with what I do. I have learned a lot about the Marines that I didn't know growing up in the Air Force, you know, and how we do things and how we operate. And it's very different. Um, so, there's, so there's that part. And then there's also learning to work with your client. And the way that I came to be part of the uh, military commissions, I we call it MICTO, is uh, a mentor from a prior job called me up and said, hey, I have this for you. And, you know, some people that you know, you trust and you follow blindly. And this individual falls in that category for me. And so I said, okay, you know, I'll do it. But I didn't know what I was signing on to. And I am very obviously a blonde, white, Western woman. I didn't know to what extent I would, you know, be wearing, um, you know, what, what my dress, what my attire would be, to what extent my client would be willing to engage with me as a Western woman. Um, to what extent, you know, what, what was that going to feel like to develop a client relationship, which is really at the foundation of a defense attorney's job is, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you need to have your client trust you more than they trust any other individual. Mm -hmm. um, now I have a unique situation because my client is very comfortable with Western women. Um, so I have not, you know, had to wear a hijab or had to cover in any way um, or a baya, but many of the female defense attorneys with the other detainees do. Um, and they do that as a, as a sign of cultural respect. And they have had to learn to navigate a culture that doesn't always see women um, in the same way that we see women um, yeah. as a, in America. And so that has been a really interesting education. And also just learning, you know, it was not part of my education to learn about Islam. And so learning mm -hmm. more about Islam, learning more about Muslim culture, learning about the intricacies of you know, that part of the world and why Saudi Arabia is, you know, diametrically different than Yemen. And, and, and those sound like very simple things to say, but when you're immersed in it and you really have to understand the nuance, yeah. uh, it's been, it's been a real learning curve, but it's also been, it's made me, I think, a better person. Mm, that is so interesting. So also learning about um, the intricacies of national security, right? So let, let's um, transition a bit and talk about this new program that you'll be doing with uh, the Eisenhower Institute, Emerging Threats 
in national security. And when we first talked about this, um, you brought up some things that people would not traditionally or typically think as connected to national security at all, like um, civil rights and, and climate change. Um, talk to me about your thoughts and, and what you're hoping to bring out in this program. Yeah, so I think, you know, we hear the term national security and it's so easy to think, well, that just means war fighters and people in the Pentagon, right? And and I think it's really more nuanced to that than that. And I think there are so many things that touch our everyday life. And we've seen that really acutely in the past few years that there are these other things that really impact our national security. I mean, look at the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that a public health issue is now having on borders and whether borders are staying open or whether they're closing. You then take the racial justice movement and the fact that there are discussions within Congress about introducing domestic terrorism statutes. And what does that look like? And is that something that we need? And what does it mean? Um, because we've seen this rise in, you know, online disinformation, misinformation, hate group that's become much more open in the last several years. You also see the impact um, that gender has on national security. You know, going back to the COVID-19 pandemic, 53% of the, the Americans that left the workforce during the, you know, since March of 2020 were women. And why were they leaving? Because we didn't have comprehensive uh, family leave child care programs in place to support those families when child care centers closed. And so you know, it's hard to argue any one of these issues isn't directly being tied to the decisions that we're making sort of at a national level. Um, I think climate change is another one that frequently can kind of get lumped in. And you see as we're having uh, with the um, global warming, you're seeing increases in humanitarian disasters around the world and a need for the United States to get involved. And what is our authority to get involved there? Are those, you know, congressional powers or are those executive powers? And, and, and what should they be? And so I think there's all these things, you know, national security is not reserved to the political scientists and the politicians and the lawyers. National security is a topic that really needs experts from a broad variety of backgrounds to provide their perspective for how do we move forward um, in the best way possible, strategically and tactically for our country. And, and things like, you know, economics and, and manufacturing and, and how they uh, are affected by this. We've been talking in the season so much about supply chain and the, and the supply chain issues, right? So what happens when um, our supply chain is restricted and you can't get critical goods to people, right? We're not talking about tennis shoes. Um, we're talking about maybe medical supplies. I mean, we saw that early on with COVID, right? Where there were um, medical supplies in short supply, and this is a, a life or death issue. Very much so. And, and these issues aren't going away, right? I, I don't think, you know, the period we're living through right now, we have certainly lived through tumultuous periods in American history before. So that it is not so unique as to say we have never seen this before. But we can most certainly say going forward, it's not going to end. And so we now need to figure out like what our new normal looks like and how are we going to approach it. I mean, if you listen to the, uh, the World Health Organization, the COVID-19 pandemic is not a once in 100, every 100 years thing anymore. We are likely to see more global pandemics. And, and when we had started to see that you know, over the last three decades, but it's now becoming much more profound. And then with global warming, you're now seeing a larger refugee population. And so borders are having to readjust. Populations that were traditionally within one country's borders are now moving to another. What do you do about that, both from a security standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint and a humanitarian standpoint? Mm -hmm. um, and again, who's making those decisions? And if you don't have the other voices in the room, the people that come from liberal arts backgrounds, the social scientists, the people who have an understanding of you know, the hard scientists or even the arts and culture aspect of it, you are just not going to make the best decision. And so for me, it's really important what I'm looking to do with this program is open the aperture that this is, this is not a conversation that anyone should feel intimidated by having. I want people to feel really welcomed into this conversation because the more smart people we have in a room, the better we're going to do for America. 
well, you walked right into Annie, what I was thinking about, which is who's out there dealing with this, right? Who are the officials, the organizations, the uh, community organizations, the, you know, you talked about arts and humanities. Um, where are these conversations happening, connecting security um, to things like racial justice or climate change, as you mentioned? Yeah, and I think it really depends on the administration, right? And so, and I think one of the, one of the reasons that I'm really excited to um, do this program, to do it in an undergraduate is because I also think that traditionally, um, a lot of these decisions have been made by individuals who are at the more senior ebb of their career. But technology is changing, information is changing at a different pace than those generations have ever been taught to keep up with. And I, you know, I'm not that old, but I still include myself somewhat in that generation that's just not on the tech. You're not that old. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. We're gonna <laughs> talk about your whole Gettysburg experience, but, but go ahead. But yeah, and so I think that it's really important. I mean, you see it with, you know, the, the BLM movement, you see it with the, the Me Too movement, like the, the next generation coming up is awesome. They are awesome at harnessing a message. They are awesome at using the resources at their fingertips and doing something about the situation around them. And so I think it's a really important thing to encourage that, you know, maybe we need to listen a little bit less to the people who know how it's always been done because that's the way we do it. And maybe listen a little bit more to the people who are asking the, well, but why? Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation with, you know, sort of this generation. So the, um, the folks, uh, my friend Jamie over in communications and marketing would love you because I think you've just laid a really good foundation for a liberal arts education and, and why we need to really be big thinkers and why we need to be critical thinkers when it comes to these really important things that, that our country is facing. So you mentioned this briefly, but kind of walk me through what you're hoping to introduce students to um, specifically through this program and, and what you're hoping to expose them to um, with this new, new focus. Sure. Um, so, you know, I don't think that anyone has the answer to what is national security anymore, right? There's no, there's no one liner I can give you. How do we even define it? Like people don't even define it the same way, right? Right. And I think people will often define it based on their own sort of interaction with it. You know, so you're going to have individuals from the intelligence community who are going to define national security based on their lived experience, but that's not all of it. And so what I'm looking to do is give a very broad sort of macro level view of national security, um, but then do modules that will focus individually on issues that have not typically been looped into the national security you know, paradigm. And so to do a module specifically on um, you know, racial justice and to do a module specifically on gender issues and to go into each one of these modules, not saying this is national security, but asking an open-ended question of, is it, should it be? Where should it be prioritized among a plethora of other national security issues? What's most pressing and why? And I, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I'm really looking to get together a cohort of students who are willing to engage in an open and earnest discussion of what are frankly some pretty tough issues, right? These are hard, hard conversations to have in a group setting. Yeah. Um, but to have those hard conversations and to help these students sort of identify what's most important for them as they're thinking about the next step in their life and how can they make a difference. And I think, you know, even kind of what do I want out of this is I would like to be able to, to leave students with a deliverable or a written product that they can take on then to job interviews or to graduate school applications to say, look, I've, I've really spent some time thinking about the world that I live in and here's what's important to me and why and here's what I want to do about it. That's just so exciting. So can I sign up? Am I too? I'm, I guess I, I guess I have to get accepted into Gettysburg College first and, and become a student. Um, but it just seems like such a, a rich and exciting and important discussion to be having, as you noted, at that age, right? When you're in college, before you enter um, the workforce, because these are, are issues that in some cases are not being thought about um, and need to be brought to the table. Right. Yeah. Right. 
All right. So let's talk about Gettysburg. So you are, you're a grad, um, which is one, one of the reasons I'm so excited to bring you back. I think students will very much connect with the fact that um, you have uh, walked the halls and walked the campus and, and sort of been in the same place uh, that they are. So tell me about your Gettysburg years. How did you end up there and, and what was your experience like? Yeah. So I love Gettysburg. Um, I, and I grew up in a very, very rural part of Pennsylvania, um, smaller than Gettysburg, <laughs> which is maybe hard to believe for some. And so Gettysburg was awesome for a lot of reasons. I was a political science and a philosophy major, um, which are both very cool departments. And I had professors who genuinely cared. Um, and I think part of why I have such a soft spot for this age group is it's the age group that I really changed at. I just was exposed to ideas at Gettysburg that had, had never been presented to me in sort of the small town that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, and I really had my eyes open to a lot of things. And the story that I often tell is, you know, the very first time I learned about Guantanamo Bay was at Gettysburg College. And it was during an outside class um, with the then newly declassified um, Bybee and you memorandums, which were the Office of Legal Counsel memorandums that authorized the Bush administration to engage in enhanced interrogation techniques. And so I can remember the class sitting out there and being so incensed, like how, like, I love my country. I still love my country, but how could they, how could my country do this? And how is this possible? Hmm. But not thinking I could do anything about it. Um, I certainly never would have predicted that 15 years later, I would still be reading these same memos. Just yeah, I was going to ask you that. You had no idea at that point, right? <laughs> that you would be so actively engaged yeah. um, with, with Guantanamo Bay. I always thought I would end up in the military because I had come from my two big brothers were in the military. Um, and so I always sort of knew that would be the path I would take at some point in my life, but certainly never could have expected the trajectory, you know, and, and so, you know, to look back and to realize, and, and that's, a, a story I share because it's unique. Because one of the things that I didn't realize about Gettysburg when I was there, and maybe, maybe you can't, is just what a good education I was getting and in what a mm -hmm. unique capacity, because we had, I mean, I took a class in torture. I took a class that dealt with Guantanamo Bay. I took classes in all of these things mm -hmm. that if you look at course um, catalogs across America, you're not gonna find at every school. I Absolutely. noticed that and I'm, you know, I'm new also, I'm, I'm two months into this position. And uh, one of the first things that I was really impressed with were the first year seminars. And I walked in and I'm like, what are all these really interesting courses um, that you get to take in your first year? Because you know how college is at many schools, um, you know, your first two years, you really don't take stuff that's that exciting. Like the stuff that that makes you passionate and, and, and the things that make you want to inquire more. You're taking kind of the basics and then maybe you get into some of that um, junior and senior year. But from the get go, there are these really exciting uh, hands on type courses, uh, as you mentioned, that really give students an opportunity to think deeply. And, and as you talked about, you know, what can I do about this? Yeah, I mean, I can still remember my first year seminar. It was with uh, Dr. Mott and it was on American government. And I can, it was the first time that I read a legal case, you know, and I didn't know how to do that. And I can still remember missing the point, you know, and, and but, and- It's learning. an important part of learning. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and learning and, you know, when I have gotten out, when I've been, you know, in, in graduate school and now even in my professional world, and I tell my my colleagues, my peers, well, I had this exposure, they're always so impressed. Mm -hmm. And and it so you know, I didn't I didn't know what I didn't know back then. I just landed somewhere where I was really lucky. And I think the other thing that it was always consistent um, at Gettysburg was just how much my professors cared about me. Like not cared about their students kind of in that that global term but yeah. cared about me and cared if I was doing okay yeah and, and knew about me I I think I have had I, throughout my college career I think I had lunch or dinner at every one of my professor's homes at some point in time wow um you know because they really just took us in and and that is also unique because Gettysburg was a safe place for me to fail you know and you've got to do a lot of failing before you succeed and they made that an okay learning environment, um, you know, and, and then just from the social, I mean, my two very best friends in this world are my, are two of my roommates from Gettysburg College. One is my first year, for, like, roommate, and, you know, 
she had her baby recently and I went up there and took care of the babies of her. It, those are the relationships you make at Gettysburg. Yeah. Um, and they stay with you. And so it, it really formed a lot of who I am and gave me the confidence to go on and do the next things. That is so exciting. So I have to ask you this because every time I have a conversation with or, or maybe even interview um, women, we always end up coming around to this work-life balance thing. And, and I think it's important for uh, professional women like you and I, for women who um, have families and have personal obligations and have very demanding careers to really discuss that publicly in order to not only inform, but maybe inspire some, some younger women out there that um, it's doable. You know, we go into this sort of, you can have everything, but it's not easy. See, so we we saw a little bit of evidence. Uh, I don't know if people noticed. You told me that you had you had your dogs there, and I they've been very good. I have barely heard them. And in the back. Now, now now that I call them out, they'll probably start barking. <laughs> um, but you're also a mom, and you you balance all of this. So what you know? What's your secret? Um, I don't know. Um, no, I think somebody said to me once. If it's really important to you, you'll do it. And I, I say that that can sound a little bit like, you know, pull yourself up. That's nonsense. That's not what I mean. What I have taken it to mean and what I found to be true in my life is you will laser focus in on your own priorities. You will find yourself doing certain things over others. And whether or not you're consciously making a priorities list or unconsciously making a priorities list, you will lean into the things you want to do. And so it's trusting yourself enough that when you're not leaning in to let yourself know it's okay, that maybe that's not the responsibility you need to be focused on right now yeah. and, and giving yourself the permission to not be at all, all the time. Um, you know, to, and, and that to me is, that's really important. Yeah. That's been the best that I have found is to acknowledge that, look, sometimes I just can't, sometimes I don't have the bandwidth to respond to the email because I have this other thing. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, RBJ has a great anecdote about, you know, one of the best, biggest decisions you make in life is who you do it with. And I think that is very, very true. Um, I am very, very fortunate to have a partner who is very much a team player who, who parents and does the school pickup and bakes the cookies for the cookies, you know, like does all of those things. Yeah. And, and so it's okay that you don't. It's okay that I don't. Because, because you have that power. You know, I you you bring up, I know we've got a couple of minutes left and, and I do want to leave people with a, with a couple of reminders, but um, you bring up this, this thing that I think so many of us worry about, which is, is it okay not doing it all? And it is. A, a colleague, a former colleague of mine, Renee Seiler, wrote a book called Good Enough Mother good enough being the emphasis. Um, and I, and I love that. I, I still have it. And in fact, I may have it here in my office and I have loved, um, really getting to understand and it's taken some time and it's taken some maturity, which is why I like to share this message, um, with people. Maybe it doesn't take them 20 years <laughs> to figure out as it did some of us that, um, focusing on those priorities is really important and figuring out not what, I'm expected to be or what I'm expected to do, but where's your, where's your heart and where's your passion and where's your motivation? Where's your priority? And then follow that path. Yeah. It's really trusting yourself. And I think for me, it's really important. I have two little girls, you know, they need to see their mom doing all the mom things. Right. But also being satisfied and being fulfilled. I mean, I did it, got a graduate degree after my kids were born and not easy, but I love that during an era of zoom, you know, class, my kids sat in with me, you know, yeah. they're not there. Remember that they're always going to have seen their mom really working hard to be the best version of herself. And that I hope will give them the confidence to maybe make all of these decisions down the road a little bit easier. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see their mom on campus. We're going to wrap up now. We've got we're about a minute to go, but I can't wait to see you on campus. I am so thankful that you've um, found the time and, and made the priority to, uh, to join us for this program this spring. So just a reminder, the deadline for our applications is December 12th. We are really looking forward to students um, leaning in, as you said, and, and being a part of this. And then join me 
on December 10th. So we're doing another Facebook Live on December 10th with Joe Bubman of Urban Rural Action, talking about the upcoming National Day of Dialogue, because a big part of what we do um, is really try to promote civil discourse. And leading up to um, January 6th, that's going to be another hot topic. So we're going to talk to Joe about that on the 10th. But thank you so much, Annie. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you got some lunch and we hope you learned and we look forward to seeing you next week.